Hello and welcome to The Rabid Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-atheist. Welcome to my channel. Like and share this video. Join the Rabid Nation, a nation of people dedicated to normalizing atheism and deconversion. And hit it by hitting that subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel in a more tangible way, hit the join button. And your membership options that lead to citizenship in the Rabid Nation will be presented to you. Uh, today, I'm freewheeling. It's it's a, a rabid reflection, so I don't I sometimes use talking points in the script, but I don't always. And today, I just want to ask a question: What is a worldview? And does atheism qualify as one? Um, as an atheist, I always I hear it all the time. Well, you're, according to your atheist worldview, and I'm like, can atheism be a worldview by its nature? Because I don't. I think people who level that accusation never really tell me what they mean by worldview. What, what do you mean by worldview? And so I'm going to kind of break down what I think some of the elements of a worldview should be and what other people say a worldview should be. Like, you know, to me, and I don't use this definition I found online, a worldview is a set of beliefs and about the fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence all your perceiving, thinking, knowing, and doing. The seven key elements of a worldview are, one, a view of human nature, two, a view of a good life, uh, three, equality with others, uh, four, responsibility to others, and five, relationship between the individual and the state. Okay, so that would have, what is your relationship to between other individuals in society and what is your relationship to the government? So that would be five and six. And then other key elements that can be in a worldview are like anthropology, cosmology, and epistemology. In other words, how you view human, your fellow human beings and culture, how you view the universe, and how you view knowledge and the acquiring of knowledge. So there's a lot there. And so the question becomes askable that does atheism qualify for all those things? Does it actually provide an answer for all those things? And I would say no, um, because atheism is simply say, saying, I don't believe in a god. Okay, I may say I don't believe in God because the evidence isn't convincing, or I may say I don't believe in God because I think I can prove that he doesn't exist. Those are the agnostic and Gnostic atheist positions. But that's all it posits. Okay, it doesn't posit a lot of things. So let's, let's take a look at it. Does that negation, that non-belief in God, give us any kind of view of human nature? I suppose indirectly, because if you don't believe God is creator, then human nature has a, a, another aspect to it, but it doesn't tell us what that other aspect would be. So right away we have atheism negating certain answers to what the human nature is, but not necessarily defining what human nature is. Uh, can it affect our view of what a good life is? Um, no, I, I don't even think that atheism even deals with that question. It just kind of posits that, you know, there is no God, so what is a good life then? Okay, it, once again, it negates a direction we might look for answers as an atheist, but it's not going to tell me what those answers are. It doesn't get, have that ability to give me those answers because it's just a negation of God, equality with others. Um, once again, I, I think... It negates looking to God as, or any kind of deity as to why we have equality with others or whether we are equal with others. But it doesn't answer that question. It just says, I don't think this is the answer. Okay, I'm going to remove this answer because I don't believe in that answer. But it doesn't tell me what the other answers could be or which one is correct. What are my responsibilities to others? Once again, the only responsibility I negate with this thing is, with atheism, is I don't have a responsibility to God because I don't believe he exists, okay? So it negates one responsibility to others. But what is my responsibilities to others? You know, how do I perceive that? How do I think about that? How I, do I know what I need to do? What am I doing, okay? And so it gets rid of that, okay? A relationship between the individual and, say, the state. And you can divide that into the individual in government and the individual in society. 
Well, once again, this doesn't tell me much. Atheism doesn't give me an answer to that question. It negates God involved in government and God involved in society, but it doesn't give me an answer to that question. I, I have to go to something else to give me the answer to that question. And of course, uh, you know, the other issues of, you know, anthropology, cosmology, and epistemology, I suppose I can negate God as creator of those things, but I can't really do much as far as getting answers. I have to go to other people that are studying anthropology to get the anthropological answers. I have to go to people who are studying the cosmology of the universe and getting answers. I have to go to people who talk about how we know and what we can know and, and to what extent we can know it with epistemology, but I can't get the answer from my atheism. And so as I look at what a worldview is with all these factors, into it, I, I could simplify it even further and just talk about you know, what are my religious viewpoints on the world, what are my political viewpoints, and what are my personal, you know, lifestyle viewpoints, and I could call that a worldview. But even there, it just answers one question, the religious question. It doesn't talk to me about my politics or how I interact with other people. And so I'm left a little bit baffled because every time I look up some sort of definition, this, this is just one definition I found on the Internet, and there were many, you know, what constitute a worldview. And even the most simple ones, I'm like, I, I can negate certain answers to those questions of what would be in my worldview if I answered certain questions that define what my worldview is, but I can't answer them with atheism. I can only eliminate certain answers from, from being possibilities to me because I'm an atheist. And that kind of makes atheism part of my worldview, but it, it doesn't even have the ability to even be a worldview. I don't think it does. And I think what happens with a lot of apologists is they, they have this overarching agenda. And let's say instead of using atheism, they use like secularism as an umbrella term. That doesn't have the punch, does it? Because as, as somebody who's a Christian, I could understand a secular worldview, particularly with government, okay? And understand, you know, as a religious person, I want a secular government that treats all religions equally and doesn't exalt one over the other. Even as a Christian, I could recognize that, okay? I know some Christians disagree with that, but for me, I could have that secular viewpoint. So it's like they can't use secularism as a term because it's not as as propagandized against, okay? It's not as demonized. It's not as looked down upon because other people say, well, yeah, I can see valid points of the secular point of view. You can't use, you know, like Father Casey this week, he, he uses materialism. Well, you can't call everything that I hold as a worldview under materialism. You, you can't do that. There's no, it would be a massive category error to say that everything falls under a certain one type of materialistic viewpoint. It just, no, that wouldn't work. You know, um, so those umbrella terms don't work, but they also don't have the punch. Because the one thing I think, and the reason why apologists use atheism as this, the atheistic worldview as the overarching term, instead of saying calling it secularism or materialism, a materialistic worldview or a secularistic worldview, is because atheism, the, the idea of being an atheist, has been so propagandized against, it makes it a real emotional <clears throat> punch term. But when you really look at atheism, can it answer all the questions that a worldview posits? That how do I know something? What is the nature of the universe? How, how do I think about my relationship with other people and with the government and with society? How do I look at people? Are they good people or bad people? <clears throat> um, what is the nature of humanity? Those are all questions my atheism in and of itself can't answer. It needs help. It needs some other source for those answers. And so atheism isn't equipped to answer those questions because it only says one thing, that there is no God. But, you know, that's my answer to the question. I just don't think it's equipped to do that. And I think there's a reason why apologists 
refer to the atheistic worldview because the secularist worldview or the materialist worldview either causes people to scratch their heads or go, well, I, I can see points in that. But the atheist worldview, you know, those evil atheists, you know, it, it's so been propagandized as a term. This is why I work to normalize atheism because it's simply, I look at all the God claims and they're not convincing to me, okay? It, it's not just Odin that isn't convincing me to me, although I, I like the character. It's not just that Zeus is unconvincing me, it's also Yahweh and Jesus, okay? And, it, and when you cross into somebody's actual religion, that's when they get upset with you. Okay, and they want to special plead and put the little fence around it and everything. And then they want to demonize you for even bringing up the question. And so that's kind of, you know, my thoughts on it. I'd be interested in anybody else because I tried to answer this question. What is a worldview? Okay, you can come up with your own definition. You don't have to use mine. And does atheism qualify as one? For me, the answer is is. There is this thing called the worldview, but it encompasses so much more than my atheism. And because of that, and, and because of the, the limitations of atheism, unable to answer some of those worldview questions, I would have to say, no, it doesn't qualify as a worldview. And the apologists are going to continue to use it. Don't get me wrong. It, they're not going to listen to me and just change the way they do things. But I can go in and say, no, wait a minute. No, my atheism doesn't ask all the answer all the worldview questions. Okay, so it doesn't really qualify as a worldview from that standpoint. That's one answer that I can give, at least. I um, had a few comments I want to deal with. Uh, there's a, some discussion on it, you know, when I talked about the lack of evidence that the Hebrews were even in Egypt. I want to make you a comparison. There, Paul Agia did a, a video on the gospel writers not too long ago, and laid out all the facts of what we know about the actual gospel writers, where we get the information from. And his conclusion is there's an appalling lack of evidence, okay, that Matthew wrote Matthew, or Luke wrote Luke, or Mark wrote Mark, or John wrote John. There's really no, all of them are anonymous, and so you have to go to other sources, and the other sources are like second century at closest that say that these are the way they were written. And who wrote them? And by that time, Christianity is much more established and it has a, a more religious feel to it. It's not just a, a religious movement. It's a religious institution by this time. And so I can see where culturally and anthropologically and all this other stuff, they would start to sh shore up their beliefs, okay, and, and give some authority to them by, like, saying some of the apostles wrote these gospels. And the response to Apologia's video was, yeah, we don't question the facts, but we're going to come up with excuses as why the evidence doesn't exist. And as embarrassing as the lack of evidence is for the writers of the Gospels, as embarrassing as that is, you know what's more embarrassing? The absolute lack of evidence that the Hebrews were in Egypt, that they crossed the Red Sea, that they wandered around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years, that they had a conquest of Canaan under Joshua. It's embarrassing lack of evidence that's even worse than that. There's nothing. And I have people, you know, well, you know, the Egyptians kind of like revised the history out of it. A couple of things with that. Do you realize how absolutely complete that would have to be? Because the lack of evidence is so astounding that every shard of pottery, every house that they would have lived in, every everything they could have written on, all of it, you would have to literally get rid of and find some way to destroy it in such a way that nobody could figure out what you did. We're talking a grand, glorious conspiracy on a level that I can't even conceive of in the ancient world. And would it be even... Would you be able, able to pull it off? See, because it's not just the internal stuff inside of Egypt that doesn't have this evidence... None of the nations around Egypt record anything like, oh, I don't know what happened in Egypt. There was like these 10 plagues and it just destroyed the economy and everything. Nobody says that. And how would you stop people who disagreed with the government kind of like removing the Hebrews from all history in Egypt? There would be people that would be rivals to that idea that would put things in different places or fight against that or wouldn't comply 
you're talking about an absolute obedience. Now, I get the Pharaoh is a big dude in Egypt, but I am fairly certain that not everybody served him because that's kind of human nature. And so, I, to be honest, I don't think that's even possible given the size of men. And we're talking about 400 years span. We're talking about two great leaders in Joseph and Moses that have an absolute impact, according to the Bible, on Egyptian economy and and their gods and their worship and everything, and nobody writes anything about it? Nobody says anything? No, there's not a shard of pottery of these Hebrews that were there, all two million of them by the time they're done? That, that's unbelievable. That's completely unbelievable to me, that there would be no evidence. I mean, not to mention the whole Red Sea thing, you know, the Sinai Peninsula, 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and they left no traces whatsoever. None. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what's more easeable to believe for me, that the Hebrews revised Egyptian history when they wrote the Bible, that either they knew full well that Egypt was in charge of the Levant and they wanted to challenge that notion, the historical records of Egypt, and somebody said, well, why didn't the Egyptians try to correct it? Who says they didn't? Okay, uh, we really don't know, but why would they? Why would they care, okay, what this tribe of ingrates does? You know, they don't, they don't care. Um, and so they're going to make claims, the Israelis are going to make claims, and nobody's, nobody's going to give a crap. To me, it's more likely that the scholars, that the people that put the Bible together, the Old Testament together, were doing their own revisionist history. They didn't like get rid of Egypt, but they got rid of the notion that Egypt was in charge in that time. Or they didn't know. And they made the mistake of thinking that back in the day when Exodus would have taken place, according to their own timeline, that they would have been escaping from Egypt to Egypt. They didn't know that. And so they make a mistake. They make a very big one. It's very possible for them to have made a mistake be revisionist history historians themselves, doing all kinds of other... The point is, I'm not saying what happened. I'm saying there's a whole heck of a lot of alternatives on both sides. But the one thing we know for damn sure, if we follow the Bible's timeline, at the time the Exodus is supposed to take place, Egypt controlled Palestine. They controlled the Levant, okay? They had... They were there, and archaeology confirms this. And so... I don't know what you know what what you're going to do with that. Uh, I had an interesting thing happen this week uh, on my video where I talked about the insidious nature of Jim Bob's apologetics. I had a visit from Prophet of Zod who left me a comment, and I wanted to thank him for that. Um, there's this, you know, I have imposter syndrome pretty bad most of the time when I do these videos, so. I'm not really sure what I'm doing talking to these people and dealing with these people. It's like, you know, these are people I've watched for years in some cases, and it's like I have a great deal of admiration and respect for what they do. And so when one of them stops by and says, yeah, you know, I think your decision not to debate him was a good one, and, you know, that, you know, he, he was obviously, because he just released his own video against Jim Bob recently, he was, you know, kind of probably poking around doing research and things like that and came across my video and I felt it was nice of him to stop by. I've, me and Prophet of Zod have a very similar background of church leadership, so a lot of what he says resonates with me. So it's kind of nice to have somebody by. by but that was an interesting thing that happened this week. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, I also had some comments this week asking me about my spiritual experiences and why, you know, you know, we have these universal spiritual experiences around the world of human beings having these spiritual experiences. Well, first of all, I think a whole bunch of people having spiritual experiences as proof of anything is kind of an argument from popularity. It doesn't mean that, it's that those experiences are necessarily true. But when we look at psychology... Um, you have chemicals in your brain called endorphins, and religious ecstatic experiences fire those. And it stimulates the same area of the brain as sex and drugs and all the rest of it. And people can put themselves into these states of expectation and all this other stuff. And as a former Pentecostal, I can also tell you some other things about this. 
Pentecostalism and the whole miracle thing and everything died when I began to study illusionists. When I studied the magicians and the illusionists, I began to study how they did their stuff. And I suddenly realized that a lot of these kind of minor magic tricks that illusionists use could easily be performed by a preacher, especially the mentalist ones where you, you play the mind games with people. Like, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of a number, you know, uh, cold reading, you know, definitely something I saw in Pentecost where, where revivalists would cold read somebody. And it's, it's a technique for getting information out of a person. And nobody remembers that how wrong, like 90% of the questions and the statements were, that once the guy keeps fishing, he finally gets the right answer from the person and he goes down that path. And you can predict anything, you can come up with some you know, horoscope level prediction that doesn't really say much, but just kind of gives the generalities. A lot of my experiences and a lot of the things I saw, I suddenly realized were me being manipulated um, miracle claims turned into a bunch of other stuff. And in fact, you know, it's just kind of, the more I studied it, the more it just disappeared for me. Okay. Um, you begin to realize that when you go into a service, like a revival meeting, Pentecostals love revival meetings. <clears throat> and, you know, it, it, when I was a kid, they would be like a week long. And later on, they were like three days. They were you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. And they always start come with an attitude of expectation that God is going to do great things. And if you're in that frame of mind, anything that happens that looks weird or whatever, you're going to interpret through that mindset. And human beings do this to themselves all over around the world. The, the nature of humanity is still pretty much the same. And so... What do I think about those experiences? I don't give them much thought because I know how much, A, charlatanity and fraud is in there, and B, how much human psychology likes to be stimulated, and so it will believe anything to be stimulated. And three, our expectations. If we have an expectation of experiential experiences, we're going to certainly have them. And so, you know, it goes back to the whole argument against uh, about experience. Uh, number one, you can't transfer your experience to me. I can't experience what you experience. So it's, as evidence, it's kind of useless in a lot of ways. And two, it's the assumption of infallibility. Um, how do you know that you're not interpreting your experience wrongly? How do you, how do you feel, how do you know that the way you're interpreting your experiences is, is infallible. It doesn't have any mistakes in it. Oh, you're not infallible. Well, then you've just crawled into question your experience, and it's not very good evidence, is it? See? And so, I mean, even my apologetics professor back in Bible college said that experience doesn't count for anything. He doesn't prove a, a damn thing, his words. And, and he gave the reason why. He says, because you can't know these things. You can't know that. You know, he was the one telling me this, this argument against experience. And, and he was doing it in a Pentecostal school, so there was a little bit of, you know, pushback against that idea. And so, yeah, I get rid of all that. Okay, and it's, how do I explain it around the world? A, there's plenty of people that like to fool people, and B, there's a lot of people that are self-motivated believers that have an expectation to come into something, and if you're indoctrinated into it all your life that these things are real, you're going to come to a service and expect them to happen. They don't prove a damn thing. And once I studied illusionists, you know, those guys that go around with the, pulling rabbits out of the hat and turning wands into bouquets of flowers, I realized that something similar very much could be used in a Pentecostal service, particularly the mentalist tricks, as I said before. But once I began to realize that that was what was going on a lot of times, the, the miracle nature of it, the spiritual experience of it, so what? Okay, it doesn't provide me anything and doesn't prove anything and really can't. So there's that. Um, I think that's it for all the religious stuff. Uh, just some channel announcements. I'm sorry about the lateness of the video. This is becoming a habit, and the reason it's becoming a habit is Thursdays, I, I get up and, you know, I've got one more day of work and I'm usually pretty mentally exhausted by that time. And so I often 
you know, because it's reflections. I'm going to put it off, you know, until Friday. I'll do it Friday and put it up. But that never happens because I hit Friday and I'm still tired. So it's just kind of a bad scheduling thing for me. So I'm changing the schedule a little bit. And I'm coming up with a plan of the week of how I do videos now because it, I've got a system to it and I just want to organize the system a little bit. And so I think Reflections, Rapid Reflections, is going to be on Saturdays from now on every week. And the reason I say that is because I can do it in the morning, I can do it late Friday or whatever, and put it up for Saturday. And it's, you know, it works a little bit better for me. And then that leaves Friday and Saturday a little bit freer so that I can write my scripts for the entire week coming up. Because I want to get to this point where I'm writing all the scripts for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then... Just, all I have to do then is record when I have time to record one after another and then put everything together and post it when I have a chance. So that's kind of the way the wor wor the, the way my work week is going to go from now on. So there's that. Um, man, just it's been a good week compared to the week before. Um, much better business week when I deal with Father Casey than I do get when I deal with Jim Bob. Um, Jim Bob's kind of bad for business, um, and Father Casey was much better for business. I guess t you know bashing on the Catholic Church is irre irresistible to most of us. Um, I think next week on tap, um, I think Redeem Zoomer is in my sights with his you know uh, answers to atheist questions or something to that effect. I just I've watched it a couple times, and I I think I'm going to split it in half so I can give a more complete answer. And then, of course, uh, our Bible study, we'll be talking to heroes of faith. I think we're dealing with Joseph. And then we're going to continue on with the Jim Palmer questions on Wednesday with question number four. So that's kind of the week on tap. I don't know what rapid reflections will be. It usually is a result of something that happens during the week, and I have to deal with it. So, But I did want to ask this question of what is a worldview, and does atheism qualify? And I don't think it does. So there's that issue. Um, so... Uh, as we head forward, you know, thanks for stopping by. Um, I'm really working on just trying to be more consistent with this stuff and scheduling changes and getting recordings in and then doing the work on the videos during the week when I, all I have to really do is edit and stuff like that. So I'm kind of trying to get into a routine with it. So uh, be patient with all that. Continue and try to improve the channel. Always open to suggestions and good constructive feedback. I've had a lot of that this week, so thank you very much. I uh, want to just give a shout out to my members, to my citizens and my rabid citizens. Uh, grew a little bit this week, so thank you very much uh, for to our new uh, our new uh, citizen. Thank you very much. Um, and then, of course, uh, all of you that continue to subscribe, uh, the channel continues to grow. So. Thank you very much for that. Uh, appreciate all the support. I even had a comment this week, you know, you, you deserve a better studio. Maybe I deserve it, but I can't afford it. So, you know, keep those uh, super thanks and super chat coming and, you know, continue to consider membership and continue to watch the vids. And, you know, I'll get closer and closer to have better stuff to do my work with. So as we continue to move on and normalizing atheism and deconversion, so there's that. Uh, and as always, you know, thanks for stopping by um, and uh, remember to live your best life. You only get one go around and then it's over. So you want to take all your time, your money and opportunities and place them on building up yourself, the relationships with your people you love and care for to make this a better world. And don't waste them on the trappings of religion and faith because that's a dead end. And I speak from experience. And as always, thanks for stopping by and I'll catch you next time.